Okay. Hello, everyone. About 15 years ago, I found myself suddenly um, a biologist with a cave when my wife and I purchased a property on a karst area that had a significant cave. And in that time, I have been trying to transform myself from a biologist with a cave into a cave biologist. So I want to thank Aaron and Chris for giving me a chance to share some of what I've learned about conservation strategies for karst and cave in Illinois. So here's the basic outline of my presentation. I'm going to start off by just making sure we're all talking in the same language here. What is karst? Um, pointing out the major karst regions of Illinois. Highlighting a few significant karst features. Then outlining some resources for landowners and land managers. And then um, sort of looking at a case study of the cave on my property called Stemler Cave. So um, karst is a three-dimensional landscape that is created by the processes of dissolution and erosion of limestone. Dissolution is really a chemical process where the calcium carbonate in the limestone rock is dissolved by the naturally acidic rainwater. And as rainwater filters through the soil, it becomes more acidic and that dissolves the um, bedrock and creates voids. Erosion is a, more of a physical process and, and it's primarily water erosion, especially when you get flowing water that has sediments in it, you get turbulent flow and that creates an abrasive situation that enlarges uh, voids in the limestone. According to the Karst Waters Institute, about a quarter of the world lives on or gets its drinking water from karst. And in the US, 40% of the Eastern US is karst. In Illinois, just about 9% of Illinois is karst. This is a map showing uh, that there are four major karst regions in Illinois. Up in the Northwest corner, we have the Driftless area. And that's a geological term that describes a region where um, it has not been glaciated. We have the Lincoln Hills in western Illinois. We have the Salem Plateau in southwestern Illinois, and then the Shawnee Hills. Now, this map kind of paints with a broad brush. Um, my next map is a little more granular look at karst areas in Illinois. Um, so I want to point out a few things. I'm sitting at my desk here at Southwestern Illinois College, SWIC, so you can see where SWIC is located there. Um, and the um, synonym for the karst in my neighborhood is the sinkhole plain for reasons that um, will become clear shortly. All right, so as far as major karst features, uh, caves are, um, to me, the sort of hallmark of a karst area. And in different parts of the US, caves are defined differently, but they are naturally occurring voids in the earth. So that would exclude things like uh, mines or other human made voids. And in, in Illinois, we have a threshold of 20 feet. So to be a cave, humans have to be able to enter it for at least 20 feet. If you remember your basic uh, ecology, you learned that light energy and photosynthesis is what uh, fuels the ecosystems of the earth. Well, caves are dark. There's no photosynthesis. So cave ecosystems are low energy ecosystems and they are mostly fueled by imported material, organic matter that washes in or is carried in from the surface. 
So because they are lower energy environments, they are less biologically diverse. There is a smaller assemblage of creatures. And the creatures that are adapted to caves are uh, interesting. Um, they have evolved in this totally dark and, and low energy environment. So they tend to grow slowly and have a um, low metabolic rate. Um, the temperature is moderated. So it's about in the mid 50s year round. Caves um, are not limited to, cave critters are not limited to the parts of the cave that we humans can fit in. So caves are really understudied um, resources. They are one of the ecosystems on earth we know the least about because they are so hard to study and so many of the organisms are in parts of the cave that are not accessible to us humans. Um, Illinois has um, 738 caves on the record. The Illinois Biological Survey has a database of caves. So 738 caves. I don't know if that's more or less than you expected. Um, Missouri is much more cave rich. They have about 6,500 caves. States like Tennessee have over 10,000 caves. In fact, Tennessee has a much larger threshold for what they call a cave. It's got to be 50 feet enterable. A lot of our caves in Illinois are pits, or at least have uh, pit-like entrances. So a cave that is a pit um, requires some special skill sets to enter. Uh, you have to have vertical skills and rope skills to navigate a pit environment. A lot of our caves are low and wet and uh, certainly wouldn't be a place if you're claustrophobic. So that might not be a pretty impressive cave to you, but that might be home to important biological resources. Some of our caves are quite large. This is Fogel Pole in uh, Monroe County, Illinois' largest cave, over 15 miles of passage. And this is a view of Stemler Cave. So Stemler Cave is the cave on my property, which is sort of a moderately sized cave. A lot of Illinois' caves are wet, um, and water, again, is the primary force that created them, although there are some dry caves, especially in the eastern part of the Shawnee. When you get in a cave, you get a chance to see the forces that create the cave, the erosion and the dissolution. These are flowstones. So as acidic water is flowing, uh, percolating through the rock and dissolving the calcium carbonate, when it hits the air-filled part of the cave, those minerals uh, come back out of solution and create these interesting flow stones. So another important karst feature is a sinkhole. And sinkholes are naturally closed depressions in the surface of the earth that are internally drained. This is a little um, picture from a topographic map. And, and if you're familiar with topographic maps, the contour lines indicate elevation. Uh, each distance between two lines here is five feet in elevation change. And sinkholes have negative contours. So you see those little tick marks pointing inward indicating a uh, negative contour. Sinkholes form when there are voids in the bedrock and you have a cap of soil on top of that that is erodible. So over years, uh, the soil makes its way into those voids and the arch of soil above the uh, void gets smaller and smaller and eventually it may collapse and, uh, and a sinkhole that was perhaps years or decades in the making seems to open up overnight. In the last frame there, you see how eventually they will erode to a relatively smooth contour. This is a pretty dramatic view of a 
sinkhole collapse from the Illinois State Geological Survey. If you're on Facebook, uh, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, you can subscribe to a public group called All Scary Sinkhole News in One Place. So uh, in my neighborhood, many of the sinkholes retain water. So after they form and erode, um, soil will plug up the bottom of the sinkhole and they will retain water. So these water-filled sinkholes can be really important habitats for amphibians. Um, they tend to uh, undergo pretty drastic changes in the amount of water. A lot of them are shallow and they dry up in the summer and that makes them fishless and fishless wetlands as you may know are really good habitats for um, amphibians. This is uh, an interesting sinkhole um, just down the road from me which actually fills up from underneath during heavy rains. This is a, a short video here showing how the sinkhole is filling from the uh, karst aquifer, uh, filling from underneath. So that kind of sinkhole um, basically becomes a spring uh, in high flow and then uh, during each point, a sinkhole during the low flow. This is that same sinkhole later uh, in the season. You can see all the water, but a little bit has drained away. This is an um, interesting sinkhole pond in Stemler Cave Woods in St. Clair County. Um, on the left is what that pond has looked like for 15 years. I hike back here regularly and um, I appreciate the frogs calling in the spring and the salamanders laying their eggs in that pond. And I knew it was deep, but I went into the woods yesterday and uh, was shocked to see that the bottom of that sinkhole gave way and all that water drained out and it is a massive sinkhole. Uh, that's me there for scale standing up on the rim of the sinkhole. So these sinkholes can be quite, uh, quite dynamic. Um, the larger sinkholes can support fish. Some of these sinkhole ponds are semi-permanent and people uh, will often try to control algae in their ponds and copper sulfate is a commonly used chemical in algicide. But copper sulfate is also toxic to many invertebrates. And in a karst area where there's a lot of connectivity between the surface water and the subterranean environment, copper sulfate is not a good idea. So you should look for um, less toxic ways and maybe mechanical ways to control algae if you have uh, sinkhole ponds with fish and uh, you want to control the algae. Um, I serve on the board of directors of Clifftop, which is a not-for-profit group that is dedicated to preserving the bluff and karst areas in southwestern Illinois. And on our website, you can find a document that uh, is intended for landowners to um, or manage their sinkhole ponds as amphibian habitat. Now, if you're living on karst, you should really be cognizant of uh, point sources of water because there are human caused reasons why uh, soil might collapse and create a sinkhole. If you have concentrated runoff from impervious surfaces like roofs or driveways, if you have a point sur source of septic effluent or leaky water lines, a lot of these dramatic sinkhole collapses you see on the news are due to leaking water lines. All right, another uh, interesting karst feature are sinking streams. So sinking streams are the streams that disappear at some point uh, into a subterranean environment. They may just lose water along the way or they might 
plunge right over the edge of a sinkhole and disappear into a cave. Now, the last karst feature I want to mention are springs. So a spring is a natural resurgence point for groundwater. And springs, um, essentially, if you have a spring, you probably have a cave. And that is the outlet for a stream flowing through a cave or other um, aquatic subterranean habitats. In Illinois, our karst systems are very flood prone. Uh, this is a one of two side-by-side -side images of a spring in very low flow and high flow conditions. So following a big thunderstorm or a rain event, our caves can flood to the ceiling and springs can go from a gentle trickle into a, a raging torrent filled with lots of sediment washed in from the surface. Here's another one that both these pictures are from uh, Camp Van Deventer in Monroe County. Now, um, some resources for landowners and managers. So I just want to outline if you're a landowner or a manager, what, what is available to help you uh, manage your karst areas. The first thing I want to point out is that Illinois has a Cave Protection Act. And that was published or uh, rather passed in 1985. And there's two sections I would like to highlight. Uh, the first is about landowner liability. So according to the Cave Protection Act, landowners shall not be liable for injuries, mental harm, or death sustained by persons using their land including but lim not limited to cave resources, right? So I take some comfort in this when I grant permission for folks to enter the cave on my property to do research or to explore um, if, as long as they understand what they're getting into, I am protected by uh, the Cave Protection Act. Another thing I'd like to point out is section three. Uh, that section is titled Powers of the Department. And the department they're talking about here is the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So the Department of Natural Resources is, has been given the power to, among other things, provide cave owners with technical assistance and management advice, enter into management agreements with individuals, and initiate a comprehensive inventory of cave resources. Knowing what is in your cave can be an important body of information for management, particularly um, a biological survey. Having a bio inventory, it will help you identify whether there are rare species, things that are threatened or, or endangered or, or um, colonial bats, right? If you have bat colonies, and your cave uh, is subject to a lot of visitation, you might need to consider particular management strategies such as a cave gate. So um, with the understanding that there is a state cave protection act, some of our state agencies can be important resources. So I've already mentioned the Department of Natural Resources. Um, the Heritage Division seems like a natural res uh, resource for us. Um, they've been empowered to help us, so it seems reasonable to expect that. The INPC is the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. Uh, if your karst area is eligible for listing as a nature preserve, I would strongly recommend you pursue that. Having a site dedicated as a nature preserve gives it legal status and opens up some state resources available to you. Uh, the Illinois Natural History Survey is technically not a state agency, it's part of the U of I, but there are taxonomic experts there, there are ecologists there, there are bat experts and invertebrate biologists, and they might be important particularly with um, biological resources. And when it comes to groundwater, the 
Illinois EPA might be able to provide some important uh, resources. All right, another important uh, organization I want to mention is the Illinois Speleological Survey. The ISS is a private, not-for-profit group that is dedicated to protecting and conserving and studying cave and karst resources in Illinois. The ISS manages a database of cave resources. We, we, I say we because I'm currently the president of the group. We field data requests. We work with landowners to map their caves. The ISS has some very impressive folks with the skills needed to safely navigate a cave environment, survey the cave. Um, traditionally, cave surveying has used old school techniques, uh, tape measures, clinometers, compasses. Um, in recent years, uh, laser range finders have replaced a lot of those tools, but during a survey, detailed notes are taken at each survey station. Sketches are made continuously and the notes and sketches will be stitched together to create a map. And some of the cartographers associated with the ISS like Dan Lamping make very impressive maps that could be really important management tools. So here's a map of a more pit-like cave. This one is a large format map of a horizontal cave. So having a map is a really important resource. Knowing um, what the cave anatomy is like, having uh, this tool available for researchers, particularly biologists, as a, a reference tool. Um, we, we can take the, the cave map, and if you have a good GPS location for the entrance, you can georeference the entire cave map and create a line plot. And you can superimpose that on a photograph or a topographic map and see where does the cave go relative to surface features, relative to houses and other developments. If, for example, you are going to sink a well, <laughs> you, it would be pretty useful to know if there's a cave underneath that spot you want to drill in. And in fact, um, here, this is actually from Missouri, but here are two instances of well casings that penetrated right through a cave passage. So you can see how that line plot might be a pretty important management tool. There is a National Speleological Society. The NSS has a really good website with lots of information available for both cavers and uh, land owners and land managers. And then there are local grottos. A grotto is the term we use for a caving club. Um, so this is a list of grottos in Illinois. So members of these are all grottos that are affiliated with the National Speleological Society. So th these are experienced cavers. Again, they, they can safely negotiate cave environments. They're conservation-minded folks that are eager to go out and use their skills to um, get into karst environments. Many a grotto has sponsored cl cave cleanups. So caves and sinkholes, unfortunately, uh, were used for years as the local dump. People think if they tossed their garbage in a sinkhole, it would just disappear. So um, lots of grottos sponsor um, sinkhole and cave cleanups. All right, so now I'm going to move into um, a little case study, as I mentioned, looking at the management history of the cave on my property called Stemler Cave. So first of all, um, 
you may be familiar with this map of the natural divisions of Illinois, which is, I think, a pretty cool, um, uh, pretty cool map. Stemler Cave is located at the northern end of the Ozarks, the Ozark Natural Division. And so you might be surprised to learn that Illinois has an Ozarks, but um, it does. The uh, Salem Plateau, the geological feature that creates the Ozarks, spills over onto our side of the river and southwestern Illinois is the very easternmost edge of the Ozarks. I showed you guys this map before, but um, the most cave rich part of Illinois is uh, in the southwestern part. Uh, there's over 300 caves known from this area and most of those are in Monroe County. The Salem Plateau is also referred to as the Sinkhole Plain, and so named for the density of sinkholes. There are over 15,000 sinkholes that have been mapped, mostly in Monroe and neighboring parts of Randolph and St. Clair County. This is from the Monroe County uh, GIS website. Every one of those red dots is a mapped sinkhole in the Waterloo area. So the sinkhole densities can become really intense. I mentioned Clifftop. Um, Clifftop owns um, a 535-acre parcel in Monroe County. We purchased it in 2013. At the time, it was a farm, and most of that has been planted now in prairie to control erosion and provide pollinator habitat and as prairie restoration. Uh, a bit of it is farmed still and the income from the farm lease is used to manage the property. But I wanna point out all the sinkholes here, right? So um, in areas that used to be ag, you can see the sinkholes are either the wet spots or the clumps of trees and the trees are there because they weren't able to be farmed. This parcel sits on top of Fogelpole Cave. I mentioned that's Illinois' largest cave and most biodiverse cave. So the purchase and management of this by Clifftop is an important way of um, controlling a good chunk of the watershed uh, for Fogelpole Cave. Now in southwestern Illinois, um, there are three main karst areas. This is a GIS layer of surface streams. So I want you guys to notice how there are some gaps in the surface stream, some areas where there are very few surface streams. Um, the area I just numbered one there is called the Columbia Karst. And that is the karst, subkarst in which Stemler Cave is located. And you can see Swick is just off the map there on the left or on the right side rather. Uh, the second area is called the Waterloo Karst, and then the southernmost part of the sinkhole plain is called the Reno Karst. So um, back up there to, to area number one, there are no surface streams because there are so many sinkholes that all the surface water drains immediately down into the subterranean environment and all the streams are underground. So this is a, a little magnified view of the Columbia Karst. And the uh, red line there is the watershed boundary for Stemler Cave. Now, I mentioned the importance of nature preserves as a dedication strategy. Um, Stemler Cave was a, became a dedicated nature preserve in 1997. The landowners that we purchased from had the foresight to enter into this agreement with the state of Illinois to permanently protect a portion of their property as a nature preserve. So once it's been dedicated, it has this uh, protection in perpetuity and it opens up some resources that are available to you as a land manager through the Nature Preserves Commission. Stemler Cave um, is a large cave, but only a small part of it is actually preserved 
as a dedicated nature preserve. So there is a wooded sinkhole that surrounds the entrance to the cave. That sinkhole is about an acre in dimensions. And then the subterranean portion that is on our property uh, before it flows north and uh, goes underneath Stemler Road. So the actual preserve is only um, really the entrance and the sinkhole surrounding the cave and a little bit of the cave passage. So another really important um, tool in management of a cave would be understanding what the recharge area is for the cave, delineating and mapping the recharge area for the cave. So fortunately that has been done for Stemler Cave as well as some other biologically important caves uh, through the Nature Preserves Commission. They hired the Ozark Underground Laboratory to conduct this uh, watershed uh, assessment and mapping project. Now, the way a cave watershed is determined is through dye tracing. So researchers go out into the field and introduce fluorescent dyes into sinkholes during rain events, or perhaps they'll truck in water to flush it down. And then in the cave, there are detectors. So if you introduce dye into a sinkhole and you detect that in the cave, you know that that sinkhole is part of the cave's watershed. So Stemler Cave has a very large uh, recharge area and that means um, it's a large area across which um, contamination can happen and it's also uh, uh, makes the cave a very flood prone environment. Now if um, a cave or spring is a dedicated nature preserve. The entire watershed feeding into that preserve is eligible for listing as a class three special resource groundwater. And the, that is the case for Stemler. So several years ago, the EPA of Illinois, the IEPA listed the uh, groundwater feeding into Stemler Cave Nature Preserve as a class three special resource groundwater. It is eligible for um, higher, more stringent uh, standards. Unfortunately, those standards have not yet been written, but it's um, eligible for uh, extra uh, protections and uh, higher uh, stringent standards. So uh, th this again is the watershed boundary of the cave. Um, I want you guys to notice how cutting across the middle of that map there's a, uh, a line splitting the watershed into a northern and southern piece. So the southern piece is the part of the watershed that feeds into the cave and then the northern uh, section is the rest of the cave that then discharges at a point called Sparrow Spring. So although Stemler Cave has a very large recharge area, the actual part of the cave that humans can traverse only represents about 1.2 miles. So from the entrance to the point where the cave passage fills with water, even in low flow conditions, and humans can't go any further, that's about 1.2 miles. So there's surely a lot more cave there that we have not been able to access or haven't discovered. There is the spring at the very northern edge of the recharge area is Sparrow Spring and Sparrow Creek is formed uh, at that point. So I mentioned a bioinventory is an important management tool, knowing what lives in the cave. Um, I've been fortunate enough to build on several previous studies of the biology of Stemler Cave. I'm keeping a running record of all species that have been recorded, and right now that, that list is over 100. 
when we look at cave diversity, it runs the spectrum from creatures that are accidentals that would, I'm sure, rather not be there, like box turtles that fall into a sinkhole, to at the other end of the spectrum, these organisms that are obliged to live in caves. They are totally cave adapted. They are restricted to caves. We call them troglobites. So Stemler Cave is home to some rare, threatened, and endangered species. So there, again, have been several um, biological inventories of Stemler Cave. Um, so one of them published um, in 2003 was an inventory of the entire sinkhole plain area, all the significant caves. And at that time, Stemler Cave ranked uh, number two in uh, the number of globally rare species and uh, was uh, one of three caves that had uh, 10 troglobitic species found there. One of the cave creatures that I am particularly interested in is a state listed. Um, cave snail called the enigmatic cave snail, Fontagens antracetes. So Stemler Cave is the only cave in Illinois where this snail is found. It is also found across the river in St. Louis County at Cliff Cave and then down in Perry County in several caves. So part of the enigma of this species is its unusual distribution. Down there in Monroe County there's tons of good caves with water and perfectly good habitat, but the organism is only found in that one cave in, uh, in Illinois. Now, um, in spite of the fact that Stemla Cave is well studied and we know the watershed boundary and we have a complete map and a line plot of the cave, there are a number of ongoing threats to the cave and management challenges. And primary among those would be uh, the problem of nutrient enrichment. And that really is tied to the second point there about urbanization. Southwestern Illinois is a rapidly urbanizing area. Um, folks from St. Louis in the last few decades have discovered that, hey, it's just a short drive across the river and there's lots of land. Um, it looks very rural where I'm at, but if I climb on the roof of my barn, I can just see the arch in downtown St. Louis. So um, lots of new house construction there. And since caves are low energy environments, the introduction of excess nutrients creates a situation where surface dwelling species can make a living in the cave with the extra nutrients and then they outcompete the more cave adapted and rare creatures. And a lot of that nutrient enrichment seems to be coming from the septic systems of people living in the area. I'll talk about more, more about that in a moment. There is some ongoing issues of erosion along Stemler Road. The entrance to the cave is is right smack along the road. And uh, there are issues with invasive species. So this is a federally endangered organism, the Illinois cave amphipod, that is its whole global range is in the sinkhole plain karst. It is only known from a handful of caves in southwestern Illinois. And the Stemler Cave is one of the caves where it was originally described, and it seems to have disappeared. It, it cannot be found in the main passage of the cave. So um, in 2006, a published study compared, oops, compared um, Stemler Cave to Illinois Caverns, which is uh, a cave where the amphipod is demonstrably present. And the researchers were looking for clues as to why the amphipod might have disappeared from uh, Stemler Cave. 
And what they found is uh, a chronically low dissolved oxygen in the water of Stemler Cave. And uh, when you look at GIS tools and what's happening on the surface, the most significant difference between the two caves is the amount of urbanization. Stemler is much more urbanized. So again, it, it seems to be septic contamination. Um, I do a lab on stream ecology with my students and I bring samples of cave water in and we do a simple test for coliform bacteria and we always find them in the Stemler cave water. As you can see, thankfully, the tap water from SWIC is always negative. So in karst areas, um, septic management is a really important issue. In a non-karst area, when a um, septic system fails, it tends to uh, show itself on the surface. If you have a septic leach field that's not working well, you're gonna have smelly, untreated water percolating up to the surface. In a karst area, if your leach field isn't working properly, what it tends to do is form a soil pipe that allows that untreated water direct access to a void in the bedrock and direct access to the karst aquifer. So septic systems often fail downward in a karst area. And uh, it doesn't take many of these um, untreated septic systems to do real damage to a karst aquifer. A few years ago, I had a student who did a project where we went into the cave and collected water samples and went into the side passages and uh, did coliform tests. And of course, we found high levels. If you look at the map there, side passage three, uh, 1,170 coliform uh, units per 100 mil of water. That's kind of scary, scary levels. So I mentioned invasive uh, species can be a problem. Um, the cave is home to the snail that like other uh, cave adapted species is slow growing. Uh, you can see the growth map there. I've uh, I have a colony of these snails in the lab. I've been trying to learn a little bit about their biology. And it appears to take um, 23 weeks for this snail to go from hatching to uh, adult size. Whereas this other snail, Physa acuta, which is well established in the cave, takes about seven weeks to re reach maturity. So fast growing. Uh, high reproductive potential. They're, they have the potential to uh, compete with and perhaps out-compete the uh, cave-adapted snail. On the surface, bush honeysuckle is a real problem in my area. Um, it, the honeysuckle invasion gets so bad that there's no herbaceous vegetation. Traditionally, the woods were quite open, more almost a savanna-ish condition with grasses in the understory. And those grasses and other herbs uh, hold the soil and prevent as much erosion from happening. And when you get a heavy honeysuckle invasion, uh, you tend to get more erosion and sedimentation in the cave. I mentioned erosion as a general problem. Um, there was a big slope failure a few years ago a lot of earth washed into the cave and this is on the side that faces the road so there is the potential there for um, a hazard to the actual road. Okay um, I'm getting close to the end of my time here so I want to make sure I thank um, folks who contributed images and data to my talk particularly Aaron Addison Derek Holtman, Dan Lamping, Philip Moss, and Frank Wilhelm. And I'm sure we have some time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, sure. Re really interesting stuff. We had a few questions come in. Um, so I'll go ahead and start there and I'll encourage other people if they have questions for Bob, go ahead and put them in the chat box. 
but um, one question came in and was talking about springs in karst regions. Um, are those springs considered karst features? Are they typically, you know, connected um, to bigger cave systems or kind of how does that work? Well, yeah, springs are definitely a karst feature. So they're the outlets of groundwater. Um, and often where there's a spring, there's a cave. A lot of cave entrances are actually at the spring end of the cave. So um, if you have a spring on your property, um, you are probably in a karst area and um, you may likely have a cave. So I, yeah, I would, the short answer is yeah, springs are, are karst features. Okay. Um, somebody asked you to define uh, sinkhole throat. You used it and just wanted to know kind of what that means. Um, sinkhole throat? Yeah, the, or there was a question about that. Please define sinkhole throat. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that term. Um, maybe if I could jump back to um, my presentation here, I'll, I'll look at that slide that I showed of um, uh, a sinkhole. Um, so I guess one point I would make is um, everything that drains into the sinkhole is part of the sinkhole. So if you think of a funnel shaped uh, depression, perhaps what the throat means is the narrowest part in the center. I'm not sure, but if you had a funnel and if that was a sinkhole, you'd have to go all the way up to the top of the funnel. That's all part of the sinkhole. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or not. But. I think you did. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question is, uh, look, what's the legality of accessing or, or exploring a cave if it, um, if you have, you know, access to go in at the entrance, but it then goes under other people's private property? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's true. Um, and, and I guess it's kind of a gray area. Um, depending on how your property description works, um, whether you have mineral rights, for example, um, I believe your property goes down into the earth. <laughs> So yeah, if I entered the cave on my property and I headed north, I would technically be underneath my neighbor's property. Um, so yeah, the, um, you should probably get permission from the person whose property is above you if you're gonna be traversing that part of the cave. Okay. I know the state pays attention to that. Uh, Fogelpole Cave, um, the state has Fogelpole Cave Nature Preserve. And um, if, if you are entering the cave outside of the preserve, but then you cross into their property, they, you know, they're concerned about that. So yeah, your property rights do go down and include cave, cave passage. Okay. Um, here's a question. Uh, given that troglobite species are so delicate and cave adapted, how do they colonize unconnected cave systems? Were caves connected in the past? And does this suggest they are currently connected in ways that we're unaware of? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, with the cave snail that I mentioned, it's likely that um, the snail ancestor of the snail was widely distributed across the surface habitat. And perhaps even during glacial periods, it was able to move from one area to another. Um, it, in the case of that snail today, there is essentially no way for that snail to get from Stemler Cave in the north to Fogelpole in the south. <laughs> Um, somebody would have to pick it up and carry it there. So yeah, it, caves are like islands. And uh, in many cases, the, the, the troglobites, their ancestors might have been distributed across the surface, but now they're isolated. So you, you can sometimes get interconnections between groundwater basins, but largely, um, 
what we call the same species in different caves are likely descended from a common surface ancestor. Okay, great. A um, couple more questions came in. Um, one is basically uh, is Stimler Cave open to the public? Uh, are there other caves that are open to the public in Illinois? Uh, in, in Illinois right now, there are no caves owned by the state that are open to the public. Um, so Stemler Cave Nature Preserve is a dedicated nature preserve, but it's on private property. So that's a point of confusion. Uh, nature preserves can be private or publicly owned. So no, it's not open to the public. Um, Illinois Caverns, south of Waterloo, is a state-owned cave that used to be open to the public. Uh, White nose syndrome in bats was the first thing that shut it down. Um, it, I don't know when it's going to reopen to the public or not, but um, if you're interested in going caving, um, you probably should get in touch with a local grotto and they would know uh, caves that you could access. Um, there has been a couple questions about um, white nose syndrome and, cave, and gating the entrance of caves. caves. Yeah. Um, can you speak just a little bit more on that, kind of what that's what, what, what you're talking about with that? Yeah, um, white nose syndrome is a fungal disease that has been spreading across the U.S. from east to west. Um, it hits colonial bats, bats that roost in caves in colonies. And the mortality for some species is uh, approaches 100%. So it is a, a, a seriously uh, lethal threat to cave dwelling bats. And um, the bats are really vulnerable in the winter when they're hibernating. If they're white enough positive and someone enters a cave and disturbs them, they might use up the last little bit of resources they have available. Um, so the most common reason to gate a cave is it has uh, colonial bats and people are visiting it and at inappropriate times or too frequently. Um, so, you know, that, that's the main reason a, a cave might be gated. Okay. Great. Um, somebody asked a question about fracking, uh, you know, hydraulic fracturing, fracking, and, and what effect does it have uh, on karst areas? Yeah, um, I think, well, I, I think I'm not a geologist. So um, I think the kinds of geological formations that are prone to have petroleum and gas probably aren't the same ones that would have caves. I'm not positive. I guess I'm gonna have to punt on that one. I'm not sure. Okay. No worries. I, I know fracking introduces a lot of nasty um, chemicals into the ground. So if it's in a karst area, that seems like a pretty bad recipe. Um, what is a good website to see all of the caves in Illinois? Um, for example, the source of the map that you shared, you know, by county. Is there a place that people can view where these caves are? Um, that map can be found on the Illinois Speleological Survey's website, ilspeleo.org. Um, can't really think of another source. Okay, All right, that's good. Um, related question: Somebody wanted to know what did the, where did the term spelunking come from? And they assume it's related to spe speleology. Yeah, yes, the term speleo refers to caves. Um, a spelunker traditionally was the term for someone who um, explored a cave. Um, in the caving community, the word spelunker is a bit of a der derogatory term. <laughs> um, we, we call ourselves cavers. So spelunkers are more like two guys with one flashlight that want to go check out a cave, right? Um, and often cavers end up rescuing spelunkers when they get in trouble. 